Thank you. And we will go back under the next table very quickly, please. Um, and which where you are based? Eh, Jumela Mbatshana. Rawa mukela tauto na mala hatin leka kwano. Na ki bidua Julia mala khoa. Ginna ko Netherlands. Um I'm born and raised in Botswana, go Palate. I'm 22. I'm based in Holland and I'm a finance student. Dumelang. Uh, my name is Evangelos. I'm originally from Greece and born and raised there. And uh, I'm a part of the family from uh, Julia. Uh, she's my mother-in-law, and I'm studying engineering. Thank you so much. Dumela, I'm Queen Esther Kruger. I'm, I'm based in Rome, Italy, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm Ethan Kruger. I'm from Malabe. I'm based in Italy. She's my daughter. And I welcome you, Mr. President, and the whole delegation. I'm Amanda Bimbo van Maren. I'm married to this man here. I'm living now in the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nick Vermeiren. I'm married to uh, Amanda, and I'm uh, brother-in-law to Asad Chibimbo, and we live in the Netherlands. I'm based in Amsterdam, and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm born and raised in Botswana, this is my partner here, Samuel Kasasa. He's from Uganda. I am based in Antwerp, Belgium, and I just graduated from my Bachelor of International Business. Duvelang Kenara Tile Ketela Skoloko International School of Belgium. Jumelan Batsana, Kenaki Pemaja, Kemahora Tilerahana, a family reunification with my husband. Jumelan Batsana, Kibiduan Guyan Tabe, Kiberka Moji Dias, I sell dreams. Jumelan Batsana, Kibiduan Moses Matsuba, so Gumuchudi. I'm also based in the Netherlands. I'm with my wife, Jennifer. I work as an actor in Rotterdam. My name is Sumaya and I work in Antwerp. Thank you. Uh, my name is Malipa Lecha. I'm a recent graduate and I work as a junior sustainability uh, consultant. My, my name is Jacob Lecha Venenal. Um, I study social work and work live in the Netherlands. Thank you. I am Priska Hartner, the girlfriend of Jacob, support of the Lecha family. And I uh, live in the Netherlands and I work in detecting financial crime. So thank you and I'm happy to be here. Dumelan Betsu, ke umpile originally umpile ke lonelwe, but now umpile vandanenda. Ke tsoko kanye, but I was born and raised ko Princess Marina Hospital and ke tsoko malo apula ko khabro. Thank you. I work for the World Food Program based in Rome. 
I am an environmental and social safeguards coordinator for the World Food Program. Dumelang ke fada pa ko Gabriel Rantutu ke zwa ko mitse motlhabe ga bane ke ko gae I pursue PhD in theological KUA Leuven for the Mobile Jam. Thank you. Dumelang I'm Catherine Taylor. I'm based in FAO, sorry, I'm based in Rome, but I work for the Food and Agriculture Organization in Italy. And I'm married to this homeboy, and three of our children uh, were also born in Botswana. Thank you. United Nations. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tabo and I go to the British School of Brushwood. Can you me this I can not have to be sure like it's a coma wound? Can I have a visit? I'm a professional chef. Thank you. Do you like it? I go to the School of Brussels. It's so overwhelming. Do you like it? Give it some of the solid training. You get a palave. I live in Bruges. I am a marketing and copywriter person. That's what I do. My husband is over there with my baby. Fat and that hoe, that dog. That's my boy! and I'm based in the Netherlands. Thank you. I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm married to Linda Elimudi Remo Embassy. Thank you. I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm based in the Netherlands. I'm from a singer. Hey, it's I'm in Hungary. I'm I'm the last I'm for the last years. I'm I do human rights work for the last 20 years. I'm I'm And here again, I'm based in Belgium. I work as a research scientist, go company in Thank you. And you may not want to know, I'm going to be a little bit of 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 a Thank you. Uh, Thank you.
ra le boga ba ga etso ra la mogela gape re itumela la go litse at this moment i would um i will take the mic to mr president Let me warmly welcome and greet each and every one of you. And thank you for being here with us today. You all come from or have some very strong, strong links and affinities with Botswana. At least two people here said they come from Mahalape. <laughs> and that's where I come from too. I'm here. I have what I believe and have stated is the easiest job in the country of Botswana <clears throat> to be the president of the country. And it's an easy job because I have access to so many people, wonderful people with skills and expertise that I need only someone and deploy. First, to identify what the challenges are that plague our country. Secondly, to fashion appropriate solutions for those problems. And then it would remain for me to oversee the implementation of those solutions. So I don't have to think anything up myself. You don't need to be very smart to do this job. You just need to be able to listen and heed when you are advised. And so I want you from today to know that the country is counting on each and every one of you to provide solutions, answers to any challenges that you may either have identified or may still identify and you share those answers with us and where we think it's so difficult that it will require only you to provide the action and guidance we will call on you and we will empower you to provide the necessary guidance. So I'm throwing back the responsibility at you. You know that country. You've lived there. And you are now outside of it. You are therefore able to see all the blind spots, all the weaknesses and shortcomings in every institution and you are also in a position to imagine a different future and reality for our country. That is your job, it's your responsibility, you owe it to the country. And so we are all going to have to put our skills and our intellect and our expertise to the test. And each and every one of you must <clears throat> step forward 
and address the problems, the challenges, the opportunities in your country. Coming from Mahalape, I remember growing up like every child in Mahalape, walking barefooted long distances to school, not even understanding why one had to go through all this. And school, at some point, became a place of fun to escape, cattle herding, and be at school. I grew up surrounded by books. My, my old man was an avid reader, so I would pick up any book and read. It was an ordinary life. We grew up like that. My father wanted me to become a mechanical engineer. I disappointed him terribly when I became something else. I became a lawyer. And I became a lawyer, I think, because one of the days while standing not far from the police station in Mahala, I saw, you know where the customary court in Mahalape is? If you are at the police station, and what we used to call the mall then, you have to walk across a short distance to the Khotla, which was where suspects, criminal suspects were tried sometimes. And so I saw a guy in handcuffs being walked from the police station to the Khotla. It brought tears to my eyes. I didn't know what he was handcuffed for. It just felt wrong to me. I cried and I think at that moment, I felt very strongly that one of the things that I must do in life is to attend to problems like the one that I saw and I drifted away from what my old man wanted me to be. He actually even bought me books that tried to channel me in that direction. And then I decided to become a lawyer. Went through law school, finished, and started doing criminal defense work, fighting in the courts. It gave me so much joy. It fulfilled me. I didn't care about the money. There wasn't much of it anyway. I just wanted to be out there in the courts and deal with cases. And I did for a very long time. And the most fulfilling thing for me was to see the smile on the face of the most ordinary person when you come to their assistance, when you did all you could for them. I've done many cases, death penalty cases, and I remember all of them. And I remember one death penalty case of a guy called Janamiso Kande, who I was told, while sitting at the maximum security prison, together with the other inmates, they used to rank the lawyers. We knew who the experienced criminal defense attorneys were. There was Attorney Dick Bayford, there was Uno da Mank, and there were others. And I heard that in their discussion when they were advising each other on which lawyer to ask for, because when you're on death row, 
the state must provide you with an attorney. This man said, number one is Dumagillian Bok. Number two, Dick Bayford. Number three, Uno Danek. And this flattered me so much. This man thinks I'm so good. I'm better than Dick Bayford who was doing his final year when I was doing my first. And I thought, I must go and represent this fellow. And I went to see him, he was a big guy. So they took him, they brought him from cell number 10, <clears throat> next to the death row. When he saw me, he hugged me. And I felt, I must do everything to save this man. And so I went out, prepared for the case, and I told him, your case is very bad, terrible. There isn't much that can be done. I will do one thing and one thing only, to get you off death row. They will still give you, if we succeed at all, and it's not assured that we will, they will still give you a very long sentence. And so I prepared and drafted all the papers and I filed. Went to the Court of Appeal. And when I stood up to address the court, the Judge Kirby said to me, we are not going to hang your client. This is not a death penalty matter. So what sentence do you want this court to give you? I said to the judge, give us 25 years. And we were given 25 years with my client. He hugged me the second time. <clears throat> and the third time and last time I saw Janamiso Kambe was at the prison in Mahalapi. When I'd gone to consult with another client, he happened to be there. He hugged me the third time. I had saved his life. Nothing fulfilled me more than just that simple experience. And I've dealt with many such cases. And along the way, when the natural progression of any good lawyer's career is to become a judge, and I knew I didn't want to become a judge. First, because I'm a fighter. I wanted to be on the other side of the crash and tumble. But I think I made a decision at some point that instead of aspiring to become a judge, I want to appoint judges. And I made it my mission to pursue this dream. And I did. Against all the odds, all the challenges, and I'm sure you've faced many challenges of your own where nobody believed in you. Nobody thought you were worth anything at all. And they look at you and say, but who is this fellow? Where does he come from? They check your parentage. And they don't know your father, they don't know your mother, and therefore you are of no consequence, they believe. And you stand firm and believe in yourself and you keep going. You know, I joked when I was at the University of Botswana and I was resigning, said to my colleagues that I worked with, we used to crack jokes together. And I said to them, please come, please take pictures with me. It's very important for you. In the next few years, your own children will dismiss you as a pathetic dreamer when you tell them you know me. Please take these pictures. And we all laughed. And I don't know whether it was I was serious or I was saying it in jest, but I kept repeating this. And one of them, a guy from Kanyo called Salet, 
sent me a message the last few days and said he has he has been crying he hasn't stopped crying because he remembered what I told him and he says I did not believe now I realize you were serious I'm not sure I was serious I'll tell you that this is just believing in something bigger and better than yourself deploying your energies and resources toward the attainment of that goal and asking yourself at the end of it all which is a question that I'm told the Creator confronts you with at the end of your life what kind of human being were you? who did you help? they say it's a relational question it asks of you you lived amongst people what did you do? how did you help? how did you empower them? what kind of human being were you? And so when I was pursuing this goal, I was in part trying to find an answer to this question. What kind of human being would I say to God I have been at the end of my life? It's a personal question. I'm answering it for myself. You'll answer it for yourselves. And so I felt there was a country in distress as I thought. And its distress was a signal, a cry to me to step up to the rescue. And I did in my own small way. I could not have succeeded without the participation, the support, the prayers, the encouragement of hundreds of thousands of Batwana and others. Many of you prayed, I know. Some sent me messages encouraging, giving suggestions. Some expressing their exasperation at what they thought I wasn't doing or wasn't doing right. And I was out there in the theater of action taking flat, taking fire from all angles, bruised and battered. I carry some of the scars, some of the ontological bruises. And sometimes all one needs is but just a heart and an acknowledgement. And so when some lady walked up to me and said to me, how do you know my child? said, first, I don't know you, much less would I know your child. Who is your child? I have a nine-year-old who saw your face on the front page of a newspaper in a store, ran to the newspaper and shouted at the top of his voice, pointing at you, that's my boy. That touched me, touched me, and humbled me. And so that is why I don't want you to call me His Excellency. I'm not sure I understand what that means. I'm told it's a sign of respect, honor someone. But the biggest respect and honor you can extend to me is to call me what that little boy called me your boy that's truly for me precious it's priceless it's humbling it says to me you and I are connected tied together inextricably I'm your boy out in the street, when you say, my boy, you know what that means. That brings you close to each other. That means, I'll, I'll give up my life for you. That's, that's what it means. 
I don't think His Excellency carries quite the same potency and meaning, my boy. That's what I am. That's who I am to all of you. And that's what I want the relationship between myself and you uh, to be. You must know I'm your boy. Because I'm your boy, you should be able to reach out and say, I think you're messing up now. I think you're veering off course. You're losing it. Why? Because I'm your boy. And you are as invested in my success as I am and in yours. So this is what it is. Humility. Just that. There isn't much that the world needs. Sometimes people need just a hug. And so I tell you today, that country needs all of you. I need all of you. I need your ideas. I need your encouragement. And I receive so many bombarded with suggestions. Some of them saying, please fire this person. <laughs> Some say to me, you know, I feel I'm a DIS operative. Please appoint me to, to DIS. So there are many, and, and I read it. I respond here and then it gets overwhelming, but I, it humbles me, the most ordinary people reaching out. And everybody walks with a spring in their step in Botswana right now. There's, there's so much enthusiasm. There's so much hope. And I look at it and say, but I don't think I've done much. All of a sudden, people are happy. Some were even saying, go and bring those people who were saying Botswana is one of the unhappiest places on earth. Those who do the happiness index. Bring them now, 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 so that they check uh, where Botswana is. And others said, wait a bit because if you check now, it might be explosive. We are so happy if there's a, an instrument that measures the happiness, it will just explode. And I hope you are happy too. Happy for your country. Happy at what opportunities it presents to you. Happy that now you have a country you can be truly proud of. You can look forward to returning to. And at some point, you must return. At some point. Botswana were like that. They would go, but they always, you met them wherever. Even those who were married abroad, I'm not saying, <laughs> not making any suggestions, but even those who were married abroad, if you engaged with them, you would see in the next five years, ten years, they wanted to be back home. And so those who are married, the spouses must know, you're going to end up there. And you are most welcome, and we look forward to having you. So thank you very much. And, uh, let's relax. Have relaxed chats, moments, take pictures, hug, shake hands. That's the beauty of Botswana and being a Botswana. We are truly proud of our country. We are proud. And we must not forget They made a former president. And we take this for granted. Here's a person. All indications, all the punditry, all the expert commentators indicated that he was poised to win the election. Everybody believed. And he believed this. He goes into the election. Early during the counting, in the morning, he reaches out to me. The counting had only just begun. And bits and pieces of information beginning to trickle in. He says to me, 
it looks like you and your party are doing extremely well. Congratulations. I and my party hope to bounce back. It's still early. We will see. I sent a message to him and I said, happily, we Batswana are one family. And he wrote and said, and you are my in-law. And he was saying this because the first lady comes from his home village, Moshupa. And I said, I wrote back and said, indeed, I'm your in-law. In the evening, he now called and said, I can see the pattern. Looks like you are poised to be the next president. I want to tell you now, the counting <clears throat> has not ended yet. But I am ready to concede. I want you to know so that there is absolutely no doubt, no confusion, no ambivalence about this. And I said, thank you so very much. I was humbled by this. What kind of person, believing and almost certain that he was going to win, realizes there's now a near certainty that the very least a serious probability that you would lose, has the magnanimity to reach out and say he's ready to concede. This is a very difficult, difficult moment in anybody's life. And here's a person who has the fortitude, the strength of character, the depth of belief in democracy to say, if this is the outcome, this is what the people have said, I accept, I'm ready, I'm willing. He humbles himself. In the morning, while the counting was still going on, we were leading, but not there yet. It was around nine o'clock. He called me and said, the counting is still underway. It now looks clear that you will be the next president. I told you yesterday I was ready to concede. I'm on my way now to address a press conference and I will make the concession speech there. He said, be ready, I'll call you from the press conference so that the press can capture this. And indeed, he called me a few minutes later and we spoke and he publicly made the concession. A person like this, whatever you may have thought of him, has earned my respect and admiration at the very least. I hope he also commands your respect and admiration because this is an act of fortitude, an indication, a message to the world that Botswana's democratic traditions run deep, they are firm, and they, they admit of not the slightest doubt. And when the announcement was made, I knew he wasn't faking, it wasn't contrived, it was genuine, it was sincere. And that's how it has been with him to this day. We need, at this point, to acknowledge him and give him a big round of applause Mm. 
He has been truly a leader. And for that, we are eternally in his debt. We are indebted to him. And I thank him most profusely. And so that says to everybody, to the world, you can invest in Botswana. There is democracy, there is the rule of law, there is respect for fundamental rights. There is absolutely no threat of civil strife in any shape or form. And when I came into office, one of the things I pleaded with the law enforcement agencies on was when people are angry at something and they want to protest peacefully, I do not want to see what had been happening there before. Police coming with tear gas and shambox charging at an armed civilian protesters said what do you do you go to them engage with them and ask them who do you want to go and see i said no, i want to see that fool which one the president don't get angry they are calling you the fool it's me they may be angry at let them come and this was tested almost immediately thereafter because there was a protest. When I was told, I thought it was one person who wanted to march in protest to the offices of SEDA. And the commissioner of police called me. Here's a situation. There's a court order that interdicts this person, but he wants to march. What do the police do? I said. What does the court order say about the police? It doesn't say anything about the police. Said, then the police mustn't do anything. I said, but he wants to march. I said, yes. He, he can do what he wants. You cannot stop him, because nothing entitles you to do that. And if he is at odds with the law, the law will take its course with it. If he decides to walk, just escort him and agree with him that nothing will get broken, there will be no violence. It turned out when I saw on social media, it was a massive protest, huge numbers, and they must peacefully. They went, they voiced their concerns, engaged citizens, and as I've said, I love them even more when they are enraged and they were enraged but peaceful and so you can see that's the Botswana we know that's the Botswana we love. And we want to keep it that way. So that people are free. People are not afraid of their government. If anything, it is the government must be, that must be afraid of them. I respect you. And I love you so. And so why would I send police after you? Why would I send anybody to spy on you? I want you to be free. I want you to express yourselves. And tell me even when you are angry. That's Botswana. And that's what I want you to help me achieve and maintain for our country. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we will mingle, we will hug, shake hands, chat, laugh, and reminisce about the good days back in Mahalape, Palape, Kanye, Maung, all these places that you mentioned.
So thank you very, very much. Thank you.